Hello everyone. Today we're going to talk about CAN, which stands for Controller Area Network. I want to give everyone a primer on CAN. I mention it a lot. It's used extensively in Tesla vehicles and pretty much every other road-going vehicle that's been built in 20 years or so. Um, it's also used in construction equipment, elevators, all kinds of stuff. Anywhere you need a robust uh, computer network to carry data between different devices on the network. Um, I'm just going to give you a primer on this, um, and I'll give you resources to do your own research if you want to learn more. But I want to show you basically what it's used for with a real physical demonstration here. Um, you may recognize this thing. It's the steering wheel control module that I did a teardown recently on. This is out of the Model 3 and Y. I'll, I'll put a link in the description if you want to watch that video. <clears throat> but basically... There, there are a lot of connections on here, but I'm only using four because they're the only ones of interest for this video. We've got four wires. CAN is a two-wire uh, bus. It usually is implemented as a single twisted pair. And the twisted pair, uh, I, can, I can touch on why that is. Basically to uh, prevent the CAN bus from interfering with other things and receiving interference. The twisting negates any interference, any magnetic interference that would be cutting lines across the wiring, basically. That's the simple answer. If you want to know more than that, you're going to have to learn a lot more. But the other two wires are ground and 12 volts. They're just coming from little 12 volt uh, plug-in supply. So when this thing is supplied uh, with uh, 12 volts, it, it begins immediately broadcasting on the CAN network. This little circuit board here is a CAN interface. I'll show you where to get one of these. They're about $30 on Amazon. Um, this basically connects uh, CAN to USB and lets you send and receive CAN from a computer. And it's here connected to a laptop. So let's take a look at uh, what the CAN bus is doing. Here we have a piece of software made by a guy named Colin Kidder. It's open source. I'll provide a link in the description. It's a really cool piece of software that lets you analyze CAN. And what this is showing us, this is connected to the CAN bus, and we're seeing four different IDs of data packets coming over CAN. In CAN parlance, they call these frames. The frame IDs uh, are shown here in hexadecimal. <clears throat> if you don't know what hexadecimal, I suggest you, <laughs> suggest you Google that um, to find out. Um, CAN ID can be from 0 to 7FF in this uh, utilization of CAN, and it ca can carry with each ID up to 8 data bytes that are, you know, 8 bits each. And the CAN bus can run up to a megabit, so about 10 times slower than the slowest Ethernet, but it's very robust. And all you can have an almost unlimited number of devices on the bus, um, you know, typically that's, you know, in the range of 30 to 50, at, you know, in a car. And the way the CAN IDs are set up, the lowest CAN ID always has precedence on the bus. So you put your important stuff there that's time sensitive. If, if two things on the bus start talking at once, whoever has the lowest ID is the one who's going to get to talk at that instant. There are no masters on the bus. It's, it's everyone's created equal on the, on the CAN bus. Anyone can talk at any time and anyone can listen. And it's generally designed like a broadcast system. So anything on the bus broadcasts what it's trying to send. And then anyone who cares about it would just listen to that ID. And again, they're separated by IDs. So what, what we have here are the five different CAN IDs that the steering wheel control module is sending. And these are being decoded in real time here by Savvy Can. So um, when I click these, it expands the window and actually shows you the decoded values. And I'll get into how, how that works later. But um, basically, these are signals coming from the steering angle sensor. So frame 129 is the most important one, and it's concerning the steering angle, which is the most important function of the SCCM. So they want to get through. The, the most important signals here are the steering angle, obviously. So I'm moving the SCCM now. And you can see as I do, that steering angle number moves. And also there's a steering angle speed. 
So if I move it real fast, it moves a high degree, it's in degrees per second. So that'll move a real high degree per second. And note it's going negative when I turn it counterclockwise. So that's actually recording negative speed. And we've got some other signals in here, um, some reserve bytes, which are probably, you know, some version number, um, the validity flag that tells you that it's accurately working. And there's also a status okay. I don't, I don't know exactly when it wouldn't be okay. Supplier ID. And we've got these two numbers that are moving a lot. We've got a counter, and that's moving from zero, it's counting from zero to 15 and then starting over again. So it's a four bit counter. And that's just so that any device listening on the CAN bus will know if it misses a frame somehow, which could indicate that there are errors and the data might not be trusted. And then there's also the steering angle CRC, and CRC stands for cyclic redundancy code. It's just a mathematical way of verifying that all this data hasn't, hasn't gotten any errors in it. The CAN bus itself has an internal CRC, but this is an added one because they, they want to make sure the signal gets through uh, unmolested. And then we have another frame here, which is the right stalk. This is the shifter. So like when I press the park button, it says park button status pressed. When I release it, it says not pressed. That's, whoops. That's this one right here. And then likewise, the stock itself, right stock status is idle when I'm not pressing it. When I push it up a little bit, it goes to up one. That's the first detent. Press it again, it's up two. So that would be like going into reverse um, or neutral, then reverse. And then down is also down one and down two. So that would be like going into neutral and then drive. And then you do two clicks for autopilot. And that's really all there is on the right stalk. And then we've got a left stalk. Similar, when I pull it, it says high beam stalk status idle. When I pull it, it says pull. When I push it, it says push. There's a, a button on the end of the stalk. When I press it a little bit, it says first detent. Press it harder, it says second detent. And then the turn indicator. I press it down and then press it down hard, press it up, press it up hard. And I guess that's all the all the signals that this one uh, can have. And here we show what's a typical diagnostic message that you'd find for almost anything in a Tesla. And this is the alert matrix. And this lists a, a number of alerts which go from, from 1 to 29 are faults that this thing can have. And right now we only have one fault, and it's saying can T out can timeout, which means this is probably expecting to see a CAN frame from another device on the network. And since it's not seeing it, um, it it's setting CAN timeout. Or it's expecting to see some of these messages acknowledged, and they're not being acknowledged. I don't know which. But uh, one of those two, it's related to the CAN bus. But nothing else is faulted here. But you can see the diagnostics are extremely sophisticated. Um, anything that goes wrong in, in this thing will set a fault. And then that fault shows up as an alert in the diagnostic system and gets sent to Tesla. So if like something was wrong with the shifter, like there was an open circuit in there, it would set a one here, which would set an alert in the car. And then Tesla would know that there's a problem with this. So if you call Tesla and say, hey, my car won't shift, they can take a look and say, oh, your gear stock is showing an open circuit. Bring it in for service. Um, Interesting that there's a runtime error, so that means like something in the software has crashed. And really it's just all these different errors, memory error, I don't know what hardware error would be, or software, but like voltage too low or high, if the 12 volt voltage was too low or high, things like that. Uh, you can see how even something as simple as this device has a rather sophisticated error reporting ability. And when you look at the things like the drive unit, there are pages and pages of these, you know, on the order of thousands of different alerts that can be set. And let's go, uh, let's close some of these. And then we've got an info, which is just showing you, uh, this is how Tesla tracks the software that's put into each module. It's all the different things about the unit, what its hardware ID is, what its component ID is, the uh, CRC of the software, things like that. <clears throat> And then uh, we've got an alert log. The alert log is used in conjunction with the alert matrix, 
when an alert does get set, um, it can tell you additional information which, which caused the error. So um, like if we look at um, the alert matrix, we've got a two set right now. So let's see if, it's, if it, eh, it doesn't show you what two is. I guess uh, like it, sometimes it, it could show you the cause of the alert. So um, let's see if any of these are kind of obvious. Yeah, they're just ADC values of internal stuff. But basically this would be used to, uh, Tesla would call this cracking the log um, or cracking the alert, which would show a, uh, a, uh, a, a cause of, of certain faults. Anyway, that's it. That's the the six signals that are being sent uh, by the SCCM in real time and lots of other things listen to that. And the way um, we're interpreting these signals, if you uncheck this interpret frames, you just get the raw data being sent over the CAN. It doesn't make much sense until you figure out what all these signals are. And through a process of reverse engineering, I've able, been able to figure this stuff out and you can go into uh, savvy can and basically put in all this text for the values you figured out and um, it'll it's called a DVC which is like a can database for enumerating the signals in can anyway that that's uh, a little bit beyond the scope of this but I just wanted to give you a brief summation let's take a look at uh, can in depth a little bit here um, here's the Wikipedia article which is usually a pretty good primer they talk about what it is, um, its history. It was invented by by Bosch in 83. It was officially released in 86 by SAE, so Society of Automotive Engineers. And there's things talking about extensions that have been made. Um, you know, we're dealing with, the, yeah, I incorrectly told you 12-bit. It's actually 11 bits. Um, that's the original CAN, and this is what Tesla uses. Some other vehicles use the extended format with 29-bit identifiers, which greatly increases the number of CAN IDs you can use. Um, there's also uh, flexible data rate CAN and fault tolerant CAN and some other variations. But this lists some of the applications that you might find using CAN, agricultural equipment, uh, aviation, industrial automation, elevators, building automation, medical instruments, uh, model railways, ships, lighting control systems. And they talk about uh, some of the things that it's used for in automotive. How it's organized physically. This is what I want to talk about a little bit. Let's look at this. This is the signaling. I told you it was two wires. So the two wires in the CAN bus are called CAN high and CAN low. And the way it works, it's a differential signal, which means each wire is a mirror image of the other one signal-wise and that cancels out any interference that would be caused by the wiring. So when can high is pulled up, can low is pulled down by the same amount. So, and that represents, when that occurs, that represents a zero, whereas when they're at rest, you know, which is at 2.5 volts or middle voltage, that's considered a one. And that's how it sends the zeros and ones. They call it a dominant voltage when, it's, when each, each end is pulled up and down or recessive voltage when it's when it's not. <clears throat> Electrically, CAN bus is set up this way. So each each device on the CAN bus is enumerated by this box, and they just connect across the bus, just like phones would be connected to a phone line. Because this is a rather high speed bus, um, they have termination, and what termination is is in in the in the CAN bus is a 120 ohm resistor. And if you didn't have this, what would happen is, as the electrical signals travel down the bus and hit the end of the wire, they would reflect back because there's nothing to eat the signal. So the 120 ohm resistor simulates basically an infinite transmission line. So any signals sent down the line just are eaten by the resistor and turned into heat. But it would look the same to the CAN bus as if these wires were infinitely long. You don't want a reflection because the reflection will arrive later after the recessive or dominant signal and could distort that signal. It's usually not a problem for a short piece of wire, but if you had 30 feet of wire and you didn't terminate it, the reflection off that could be damaging enough to prevent the devices on the CAN bus from accurately decoding the signals. 
So each side is 120 ohms. And earlier I was showing you my connections here. You know, I've got the connection coming out of the CAN dongle, and then there's a 120 ohm resistor, because there isn't one here, but I have to terminate it. I couldn't terminate it inside here, so I did it as close as possible. And then this has a selectable termination on it. You can put this jumper on to terminate. So that's one end, and this is the other end. It's not exactly a perfect termination. In a perfect world, this would be moved as close as possible to the end of the bus. But like I said, if the wire's short, the reflection is very minimal. So in, in practice, it doesn't hurt anything. In reality, I could probably remove this resistor entirely as long as one end's terminated. Usually for a two-node bus, it'll work. But it, the best thing you can do when working with CAN is always try to terminate properly if you can. So yeah, this little interface is one of the better ones. It's uh, It's got a galvanic isolator in it, which just means that across this barrier, there's no electrical connection. So um, if you were to hook this to high voltage relative to your laptop, like when you're working on a high voltage battery, it won't fry the laptop. So very valuable feature, having it isolated. Most are not. So let's take a look over here. Here's the Amazon uh, link to where you can get this, and I'll provide the link in, in the description. Shows a close up. The only It didn't come with a case, so I put this uh, uh, clear heat shrink over it so it wouldn't short out on the bench or you know when you're messing with wires. It's the only disadvantage for, for it. But for $31, um, it's hard to argue with that. Um, you know, uh, it's worth a piece of heat shrink uh, to not pay, you know, sometimes the hundreds of dollars that the professional equipment costs. Anyway, uh, uh, CAN is often implemented, like here's an example of an automotive, a small automotive microcontroller. This is a small little 8-bit microcontroller. They're really cheap. This is an automotive qualified microcontroller. And inside the microcontroller, it has built-in CAN hardware. Also has LEN, which we'll talk about in a future video. But that means this can directly connect through, through a minor amount of electronics to the CAN bus. And the microcontroller has all the stuff in the hardware to directly send and receive CAN without requiring a lot of complex stuff, like the automatic error flagging and retransmits and all that stuff. And this would be something typical that you might find inside something like the steering wheel control module um, or seat controller or whatever, just a, something that doesn't need a lot of power. And then, of course, we go up to like the 32-bit microcontrollers like the SPC5 that um, Tesla uses in a lot of applications. Those sometimes include, you know, like up to six CAN buses in one microcontroller. So they can, you know, gateway across different CAN buses and have backup CAN buses and all kinds of stuff like that. But this little guy is, is cheap and simple. It's based on the original Intel 8051 instruction set. Um, I guess that's it for a good CAN summary. I'm trying to keep uh, the video a little shorter this time. You know, we're, we'll have it under 20 minutes. But if you like this video and you want more like it, uh, let me know in the comments. And also, I would appreciate the subscription. I also have a donation link if you'd like to um, support the channel so I can do more cool videos like this. And uh, if, you, uh, if you have any ideas for videos you'd like to see, also let me know in the comments. I try to read and answer uh, as many comments as I can. All right, everyone. Take care.